Hello, this is Larry Wilson, and I would like to welcome you to the eighth tape in this series on the Old Testament prophets. Today we're going to be continuing with our study in the book of Isaiah, and this is actually the second part of our study in the book of Isaiah. We're going to continue with chapter 4 and go forward. Unfortunately, my partner couldn't be here. David is out of town. So, unfortunately, or fortunately, <laughs> you'll, you're going to have to uh, endure um, a solo study today. So I'm going to pretend that you are sitting right across from the table from me here in the studio. And as we study, I'll ask you a few questions. I'd like to begin in Isaiah chapter 4. Um, we were concluding uh, on the last tape. God has sent a prophet to the nation of Israel in the form of Isaiah to explain why he is going to do what he must do. And um, over in chapter 3, uh, verse 14, the Bible, the Isaiah writes, the Lord enters into judgment against the leaders and the elders of his people. It is you who have ruined my vineyard. The plunder from the poor is in your houses. What do you mean by crushing my people and grinding the faces of the poor? Declares the Lord, the Lord Almighty. God is angry with the apostasy of Israel. God is angry that the poor and the homeless and the fatherless are so downtrodden. And he knows in his divine wisdom that the only way to resolve this great social inequity and injustice is to bring about complete destruction cauterizing the growth of sin like cancer, excising it and removing it and starting all over. And so he is pro predicting, Isaiah is predicting, that God is going to send judgment against both nations, the northern and the southern kingdoms. And in verse 24 of chapter 3, instead of fragrance, there will be stench. Instead of a sash, a rope, instead of well-dressed hair, baldness, instead of fine clothing, there will be sackcloth, instead of beauty, there will be branding, as in slavery. Your men will fall by the sword, your warriors in battle. And chapter 4, verse 1, in that day, seven women will take hold of one man and say, we will eat our own food, we will provide our own clothing, only let us be called by your name. Take away our disgrace. This is a reference to the fact that there would be so few men, so few warriors left, that seven women would take hold of one man and would seek to have some kind of identity because women uh, in Israel, um, without a husband, were of little value. It seems that in the development of apostasy, the value of women went down uh, correspondingly. And um, a woman, uh, her primary value was to produce heirs, and um, with no husband, um, what was her value? Uh, this was certainly a... a sorry state of apostasy for the nation of Israel. The interesting thing about the way God goes about proclaiming and announcing his judgments is that he always announces hope as well. He, he, he weaves hope into his anger. He, he weaves uh, redemption into his wrath. And so in chapter 4, verse 2, a prophecy is made that is quite interesting. In that day, 
speaking of the day of redemption, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious and the fruit of the land will be the pride and the glory of the survivors in Israel. The branch of the Lord. You, you have to understand some of the Old Testament imagery and the use of language to appreciate what is being said here. If you've ever cut down a tree, um, you notice that if you don't really cut it down um, and remove it, it is possible sometimes for the tree to sprout much like a bush and spring up again. And God is using uh, the imagery of a great tree. This is used throughout the Old Testament, in fact. Trees would, would symbolize nations, and a tree would become great. Its boughs would be strong. The birds of the air and the beasts of the field would take advantage of its branches and its shade. And a tree was a living thing like a nation. And when a lofty tree is cut down, the nation symbolically is toppled. In the story of redemption, there is a branch that's going to sprout from the stump of the fallen nation Israel. And verse 2 is an allusion to that. In that day, the branch of the Lord, the sprig or the sprout, if you will, will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the land will be the pride and the glory of the survivors in Israel. Those who are left in Zion, who remain in Jerusalem, will be called holy. All who are recorded among the living in Jerusalem. The Lord will wash away the filth of the women of Zion. He will cleanse the bloodstains from Jerusalem by a spirit of judgment and the spirit of fire. Verse 4 in Isaiah chapter 5 is referring to another uh, ceremonial concept that when a woman was in her period or menstruating, the issue of blood was considered most unclean. And in fact, God forbid couples to have sex uh, during the woman's period. And um, in their apostate state, Israel, uh, of course, abandoned that regulation along with a host of others. And, and so God is calling Israel a bloody lot. You know, in Australia and in England, the word bloody is um, equivalent to a curse, uh, in, a, in the United States, it doesn't mean or is not used in that way, but it is uh, um, to mean accursed. And um, so the Lord is saying he's going to take away all of the filth, all of the uh, evil, all of the guilt. He will cleanse the blood stains from Jerusalem by a spirit of judgment and a spirit of fire. Spirit of judgment and a spirit of fire. Then the Lord will create over all of Mount Zion and over those who assemble there a cloud of smoke by day and a glow of flaming fire by night. Over all the glory will be a canopy. It will be a shelter and a shade from the heat of the day and a refuge and hiding place from the storm and rain. Again, Illusions taken from the wilderness experience where the Lord was a cloud of fire by night and a cloud of smoke obscuring the heat of the sun by day. And, you know, I, I find it interesting as I have reflected on the wilderness attention that God bestowed upon Israel, how that to keep them shaded, the cloud moved through the day as the sun moved, God protected Israel by constantly moving and being between himself and the sun. You know, even in this, there is the lesson of mediation or intercession. Jesus standing in the way, protecting, sustaining, 
enabling his people. I've often said, and I believe that it's easy to affirm, that the Old Testament is really where the love of God is spoken of in the clearest and most beautiful terms. I realize that the New Testament speaks of God's love and of certainly Jesus, his death on Calvary, is a confirmation of that love. But in terms of relationship, the expression of love, um, I think the Old Testament outdoes the New Testament personally. I know some will disagree with that, but Isaiah chapter 5 is one such example. In this chapter, um, God uses some poetry, and actually, we are dealing here with Jesus more so than with the Father. When I read about God speaking, or the Lord speaks, or the Lord Almighty says this or that in the Old Testament, I find that 98% of the time, it is actually Jesus who is doing the speaking. That's right. It is Jesus who is the one who is dealing with Israel. I won't take time right now to prove that point, but I can show you very clearly that uh, all through the Old Testament and then into the New Testament, it is Jesus. He's the one that delivered them. He's the angel of the Lord who came and led them out of Egypt. He's the one who um, was the cloud by day and the fire, fiery pillar by night. He is the one who uh, is speaking through Isaiah. I will sing a song for the one I love, a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones. He planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it, and he cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I am going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge. You know, the custom in the, those times was to plant a, a row of sticky hedge around the vineyard to keep prey and animals and even people out. I'm going to take away its hedge, and it will be destroyed. I'm going to take away its protecting wall, which has been me, incidentally, God is saying. I'm going to take away its hedge and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall, and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel. That's verse 7. And the men of Judah are the garden of his delight, and he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed. For righteousness, but he heard cries of distress. Woe to you who add house to house and join field to field, till no space is left and you live alone in the land. God is speaking, of course, of the greed, the insatiable greed, and taking and stealing from the poor and the fatherless and the homeless, had become the way of life in Israel. Sounds strangely like today, doesn't it? God says through Isaiah, He says, Woe to those who rise up early in the morning to run after their drinks, who stay up late at night until they are inflamed with wine. They have harps and, and uh, lyres at their banquets, tambourines and flutes and wine, but they have no regard for the deeds of the Lord, no respect for the work of his hands. Therefore, 
my people will go into exile for lack of understanding. You know, Hosea in chapter 4 made the same comment. Speaking on behalf of God, he says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge, a lack of understanding the ways of God, a lack of understanding just um, the source of all blessings. You know, today, it's no different. Men think that they acquire and have what they have by their own prowess and by their own cunning and by their own intellectual brilliance. But how foolish. God says, take away the hedge and all of this will disappear. This is kind of interesting in verse 18, chapter 5. God says, Woe to those who draw sin along with cords of deceit and wickedness as with cart ropes. To those who say, Let God hurry, let him hasten his work so that we may see it. Let it approach. Let the plan of the Holy One of Israel come so that we may know it. Isaiah, remember, he's living and making these prophecies a full um, 120 years prior to the Babylonian captivity. And he starts his ministry in 739 B.C. So that puts him about, um, what, 17 years prior to the fall of the northern kingdoms. And, and God is saying through Isaiah, Woe to those who say, Let God hurry. Let him hasten his work so we may see it. Let it approach. Let the plan of the Holy One of Israel come so that we, we may know it. And then we will know, Isaiah, that you are a true prophet, that you really are speaking on behalf of God. Well, as you well know, most prophets predict and speak of a time that is not their own. And herein is the great dilemma. Um, Noah preached for 120 years, and because of his repetition and because of his same old song and single, same old story, a flood is coming, a flood is coming. God is going to destroy the earth. Um, if it doesn't happen right away, people tend to become careless and negligent, even rebellious. And uh, prophets uh, usually have no respect until after the event they predict has come to pass, in which case then, it is too late for the current generation to give them any respect. It's human nature to be easily and quickly distracted. Isaiah's ministry lasted almost 60 years. I believe that he was in his late teens, or certainly not more than 22 years of age, when he began his ministry. And to be a prophet for 60 years, and until the, somewhere in his 80s, um, was quite a burden to bear. Always saying the unpopular thing, and in fact doing some rather strange things that God required him to do. The Lord is warning Isaiah, warning the people through Isaiah, but it does no good. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. God is saying in plain English, you can't outrun me. You cannot get around me. You will, you must face me. Don't think that you can escape me. Don't think that you can protect yourself from me. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Woe to those who, who accept a bribe, who acquit the guilty but deny justice 
to the innocent. I want to jump down to verse 25, Isaiah 5. Therefore the Lord's anger burns against his people. His hand is raised and he strikes them down. The mountains shake and the dead bodies are like refuse in the streets. I want to bring out a couple of points now. Someone said to me some time ago, Larry, I, I just really dislike reading the Old Testament prophets because it's always down, down, down. It's always gloom. It's always destruction. It's always sad. And I said uh, to this person, I said, how is that different than the news? The evening news or the newspaper? What do you read in the newspaper that, that really makes you very, very happy and very thrilled and very excited? Well, they confessed, well, not much. But I said, well, why do you read it? And um, the response went like, well, you know, to remain up on what is happening in our world. I said, the point here is that the Old Testament prophets are like the newspaper. They're telling you what our world is like. Nothing has really changed. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And, and the behavior of men follows the same pattern and the same course uh, constantly. We have the rise and fall of 21 civilizations to prove the point. History repeats itself because people fail to learn from history. So the Lord's anger burns against wrongdoing, against his people, and his hand, hand is raised and he strikes them down. In uh, Old Testament times when the king would raise his hand, the servants of the king would conduct whatever business had to be done until the king lowered his hand. This was, a field, this was a sign used on the battlefield. It was a sign used in execution. It was a sign that as long as the king held his hand up, his servants continued whatever the task at hand was and continued until the hand was lowered and the king was satisfied. This next sentence in verse 25 is important. The mountains shake and the dead bodies are like refuse in the streets. This sounds a lot like Revelation 11, verse 8, where the bodies of the two witnesses lie in the streets of the great city, and people refuse them burial. Remember that in Revelation 11? Well, Revelation 11 is actually borrowing a concept from the Old Testament. Using parallel language, we can easily understand what it means. Whenever God executes justice upon a rebellious people, the idea is that this rebellion uh, does not deserve the dignity of burial. The slain do not deserve the dignity of burial. So their dead bodies are like refuse, garbage. And the vermin and the birds come and uh, eat the flesh. This is the same idea, the same concept that is advanced in Revelation 11 about the two witnesses. And, and jumping forward to that point, the two witnesses, when they have finished their testimony, the wicked people of the earth are so glad, so happy, that the two witnesses are no longer um, torturing them, that um, when they have rejected the testimony of the two witnesses, they are relieved. And they despise them so much that they refuse them burial it is the parallel idea. Now, for those of you who have read some of my material or listen to some other seminar presentations, you know that I teach that the two witnesses are the Bible 
and the Holy Spirit. These are the two witnesses that empower the 144,000. And as God's servants all around the world are proclaiming the gospel, they are preaching the word, the Bible, in the power of the Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit can torture and torment a person grievously. Remember uh, Pilate's wife? She told Pilate to have nothing to do with man, this man because when Jesus was before him, because she had had a dream. The Holy Spirit had, had, had distressed her. In the time period of the Great Tribulation, the Holy Spirit is going to distress grievously every heart that is not surrendered to the will of God. The Bible says there will be no peace day or night, for those who re are in rebellion against God. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. So the torment of the Holy Spirit. Now, I, I, I want to make this point very, very clear, and uh, it takes a little bit of, of, um, of a challenge to do so. During the time period of the Great Tribulation, when the 144,000 are proclaiming the gospel, the Holy Spirit will have been poured out upon all flesh, all people. And the, those who are in rebellion against God are going to have more Holy Spirit influence compelling and convicting them of their rebellion than we have ever seen before. The Holy Spirit is going to be speaking, shouting to every soul, prepare to meet God. Listen to his servants. Repent of your sins and worship the Creator who made the heaven, the earth, the seas, the fountains of waters, and so forth. Come out of Babylon. Don't participate in this crisis government. Do not submit to the authority of this crisis government. So forth and so on. Uh, this torture or torment or the work of the Holy Spirit will be so grievous that every person who rejects the Spirit, um, nothing further can be done for their salvation. The world hasn't seen a situation quite like what is described in Revelation chapter 11. The world hasn't seen the bountiful outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The closest parallel that we have happened there at Pentecost. But that's only a small parallel with what is coming upon the earth. The reason I'm uh, getting into this a little bit is so that you can understand that when finally the 144,000 have finished their work and they have literally disappeared, they're like Elijah one minute on Mount Carmel, full of the Spirit, bold and brave, proclaiming the Word of God. Then the next, after the 1260 days of the empowerment is over, they run for their lives and, and hide in the remote places of the earth like Elijah did from Jezebel. Consider Elijah filled with the Spirit on Mount Carmel and Elijah without that same Spirit power in the cave hiding from Jezebel. Same man. The difference is the Spirit. The power, the resting power of the Spirit upon him. Well, when the 144,000 have concluded their work, when the Bible and uh, salvation, has, the offer, has come to an end and the um, Holy Spirit has pressured everyone into a final decision, then God seals everyone in his condition. It's over. He that's holy, let him be holy still. He that's righteous, he that's filthy, he that is unjust, everything is finished, it's final, it's over. 
and the Spirit of God is then withdrawn from those who have rebelled. They have committed the unpardonable sin. They have rejected the, the clearest and the plainest assault of the Holy Spirit. And God says, I can do nothing further with them. L leave them alone. When the Spirit is withdrawn, the world, the wicked, will be so happy. Now, the Spirit is never withdrawn from the children of God. Not at all. The Spirit is never removed from the children of God. In fact, the Spirit lives within them. And this is how Jesus said, And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. So the Spirit is only withdrawn from the wicked because they have committed the unpardonable sin. And what Revelation is trying to say with the language and their bodies lie like refuse in the streets of, the, of that great city is that the people don't care. They don't they think so little of the two witnesses that they do not see it appropriate to give them any burial. Utter disgust, utter rejection, utter uh, rebellion. So I wanted to uh, highlight that point so that you can see how that Revelation borrows uh, enormously from the Old Testament prophecies. Um, I will show you another example of that in just a minute. In verse 26, Isaiah indicates something marvelous. He lifts up a banner for the distant nations. He whistles for those at the ends of the earth. And here they come swiftly and speedily. Not one of them grows tired or stumbles. Not one slumbers or sleeps. Not a belt is loosened at the waist. Not a sandal thong is broken. Their arrows are sharp. All their bows are strung. Their horses' hooves seem like flint. Their chariot wheels like a whirlwind. Their roar is like that of a lion. They roar like young lions. They growl as they seize their prey and carry it off with no one to rescue. In that day, they will roar over it, speaking of the nation of Israel, like the roaring of the sea. And if one looks at the land, he will see darkness and distress, even the light will be darkened by the clouds. Isaiah is pointing to the fact that when God calls and summons the nations to inflict wrath upon Israel, they will come and none can stop them. When he empowers them to do his will, nothing can thwart it. Israel will not be able, through alliances with other nations, to fight back and survive. It is very difficult to convince a strong people, a well-defended nation, that it is vulnerable to the command of God. The United States today is regarded as a superpower, invincible by most people who live in the United States. It's a lot like Israel was in its time. But God need only to summon the distant nations to come. And no matter how great and mighty the power of any nation, God simply takes it down. He sets up kings, and he takes them down. The fall of Babylon was a divine decree. The collapse of the Medo-Persian Empire was a divine decree.
the conquering of Rome was a divine decree. These are just small examples of how God is at work among the nations today. The principles with which he dealt here with Israel of old haven't changed. It is the same because he is the same. The principles are the same. In Isaiah chapter 6, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings, the seraphim. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Isaiah saw the four living creatures that John saw in Revelation chapter 4 and that Ezekiel saw in Ezekiel chapter 1 and chapter 10. It's the same four living creatures, seraphim, having six wings. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, Isaiah cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I, ha and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to Isaiah with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched Isaiah's mouth, and he said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And Isaiah said, Here am I, send me. And the Lord said, Go and tell this people. And there are several things that he once said. The point that I would like to make here is that Isaiah has an encounter with the Lord. And Isaiah's sense of unworthiness and his sense of guilt as a sinner is overwhelming to him. Not only his own, but corporately for his people. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And Isaiah thought he was going to die because he had seen the King, the Lord Almighty. It was understood that if one ever saw God, he would perish. Remember when Moses wanted to see God and God forbid it? And so Isaiah is in a panicked situation. His very life is at stake. And then one of the four living creatures, one of the seraphim, takes a coal off of the altar of incense. And he carries this coal to Isaiah, and he touches his lips, and he says, Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Interesting point here I'd like to make. If something is sterile and I touch it, it becomes contaminated. In the sanctuary service, the opposite, though, was the case. If something came and touched the altar, Instead of contaminating the altar, the altar made whatever it touched holy. 
this is an illustration of, of the power of God. When God touches something, He restores it. It does not contaminate God, for God is greater and above all. And when the angel brought the coal to Isaiah and touched his lips, he was in effect making Isaiah pure, holy. And he says, your, your sin is taken away. It's atoned for. You have no more guilt. This is an illustration of what happens to the 144,000. They are like Isaiah when God selects them and appears to them. They are sealed, remember? They are sealed before the great tribulation begins. And this sealing is the complete and full atoning, the imparting of the righteousness of Christ within them. And um, just as Ezekiel was given the little book to eat, and Isaiah receives the coals of fire uh, on his lips, so the 144,000 will be given the little books to eat, the message, the word, and like Isaiah, they will be sealed, and their guilt is taken away, and their sins are atoned for. And, and because they are first fruits, they, they are samples of what is coming to the rest of us who receive salvation through their proclamation of the gospel. God sent Isaiah to his people, say to them, Be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused, make their ears dull, and close their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Sounds like a stern benediction, doesn't it? But what God is saying is that when you preach the gospel and you preach the truth to those who are rejecting the Spirit, the gospel, when it is moved by the Holy Spirit, produces an opposite and equal reaction. When the gospel is proclaimed in the power of the Spirit, it forces submission or rebellion. There is no middle ground. And he's saying to Isaiah, you go and you speak to this people. Be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused and their ears dull. Isaiah, you speak my words. You proclaim what I need said and want said. And those who have ears to hear will turn and be healed. The others will seal their fate to their destruction. And Isaiah said, How long, Lord, must I do this? And God says in verse 11, Until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitant, until the houses are left deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken. Well, we have time for an intermission, and we'll be right back. So turn the tape over, and we'll continue. Well, welcome back to the second half of our study here in the book of Isaiah. Right before the intermission, we were discussing the call and the appointment of Isaiah as a spokesperson for God. And the Lord has sent uh, Isaiah to speak to his people. And um, he gives Isaiah um, a time frame in which to work until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitant, until the houses are left deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken. And though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. But as the terebinth 
and oak leave stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. I find this interesting. There's destruction and redemption. Even though the Lord utterly forsakes the land, the seed, the holy seed, will be the stump in the land. In Isaiah chapter 7, we have an interesting development, and uh, there's a, quite a story uh, that goes with it, and I would like um, for you to consider it. Verse 1 begins, When Ahaz, um, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, was king of Judah, King Rezan of Aram, and Pekah, son of Remaliah, king of Israel, marched up to fight against Jerusalem, but they could not overpower it. Um, this is describing a battle of brother against brother. You know, the southern two tribes were called the uh, tri children of Israel, or the nation of Israel, of Judah, excuse me, and the northern ten tribes were called Israel. So the northern, the king of the northern tribes, um, his name was uh, Remalia, and Pekah was his son. Pekah and um, uh, King Rezin of Aram joined together to come and to, do, to capture Jerusalem in the south, but they could not uh, overtake it. Verse 2, Now the house of David was told, Aram has allied itself with Ephraim, so the hearts of Ahaz, Ahaz is the king, you know, in Jerusalem, so the hearts of Ahaz and his people were shaken as the trees of the forest are shaken by the wind. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out, you and your son, to meet Ahaz at the end of the aqueduct of the upper pool on the road to the washerman's field. Say to him, be careful, be, keep calm, and don't be afraid. Do not lose heart because of these two smoldering stubs of firewood. <laughs> a, a very eloquent way of saying two, two guys about to burn out here. Because of the fierce anger of reason and Aram, of the son of Remaliah. Aram, Ephraim, and Remaliah's son have plotted your ruin, saying, Let us invade Judah, let us tear it apart, and divide it among ourselves, and make the son of Tabil king over it. Yet this is what the Sovereign Lord says. It will not take place. It will not happen. For the head of Aram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is only resin. Within 65 years, Isaiah predicting now, prophesying, Ephraim, that is the northern tribes of Israel, will be too shattered to be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, or its capital, and the head of Samaria is only Remaliah's son, Pekah. Now, Isaiah says to King Ahaz, if you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. Uh, the point uh, here is God's purpose for Judah has not been reached or fulfilled, and until that has occurred, and until God permits, there's no way that Jerusalem is going to fall into the hands of these invaders. And uh, within 65 years, uh, God is saying through Isaiah that um, Ephraim, the tribal nations uh, to the north, will be too shattered to be a people. As it actually turned out from the time that uh, this happened, it was only 15 years. In 722, um, Shalmaneser V, finally brought an end to the 
history of the ten tribes of the northern tribes of Israel, and they were totally removed and eliminated from the face of the earth. Never been heard from since. And uh, some commentators on the Bible like to make a great deal of noise about the ten lost tribes. Uh, actually, that, that is the incorrectly defined. They are the ten destroyed tribes. And um, the Bible is quite clear on that. The Lord is trying to tell King Ahaz. Now, remember, this is not King Ahab. This is King Ahaz. Ahab and Jezebel had lived about a hundred years earlier. I think Ahab was slain in about 853 B.C., and we're now at the time of um, around 722. So 130 years earlier. Now we're dealing with King Ahaz, who rules from Jerusalem. The Lord wanted to encourage King Ahaz. He, at this point, Israel had not the southern two tribes, the kings of the kingdom of Judah, to be more precise. The kingdom of Judah had not apostatized entirely. Uh, there was still hope. There was still loyalty and devotion to the Lord, and. Um, so the Lord, wishing to encourage King Ahaz, says something that uh, has confused uh, many people even to this day, but there's really no reason for this confusion. The Lord spoke to Ahaz, verse 11, Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. But Ahaz said, uh, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David, is it not enough, patient to, enough to try the patience of men? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin shall be with child and will give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. He will eat curds and honey. When he knows enough to reject the right and choose reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. The Lord will bring on you and on your people and on the house of your father a time unlike any since Ephraim broke away from Judah. He will bring the king of Assyria. In that day, the Lord will whistle for flies from the distant streams of Egypt and for bees from the land of Assyria. And they will all come and settle in the steep ravines and in the crevices of the rocks, on all the thorn bushes and at all the water holes. In that day, the Lord will use a razor hired from beyond the river. The, the use of a language here is that to humiliate their captives, it was customary in ancient times that um, victims, those who lost the battle, before they would be executed, uh, in order to be sport and an object of ridicule, uh, they would be shaven. And this is the idea of the razor from beyond the river Euphrates. Um, to shave a man was to, to make a public statement that he was impotent, that he was um, a eunuch, that he was um, powerless. And so God is going to call the bees and the flies and he is going to use a hired razor from beyond the river, the king of Assyria, to shave your head and the hair of your legs and to take off your beards also. In that day, a man will keep alive a young cow and two goats. And because of the abundance of the milk they give, he will have curds to eat. All who remain in the land will eat curds and honey. 
and in that day in every place where there are a thousand vines worth a thousand silver shekels, there will be only briars and thorns. Men will go there with bow and arrow, for the land will be covered with briars and thorns. As for all the hills once cultivated by the hoe, you will no longer go there for fear of the briars and thorns. Thorns They will become places where cattle are turned loose and where sheep run. This prophecy in Isaiah 7 can be understood in one of two ways. God wanted to give King Ahaz a sign, and this sign was that the, a, the virgin will be with child. That is a contradiction in terms. The virgin will be with child. How can the, a virgin be pregnant? And will give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel, which of course means God with us. It is my understanding <clears throat> that had Ahaz and the southern kingdom of Judah been willing to cooperate with God, Jesus could have been born 700 years earlier than what he was born. I believe that the sign that the Lord wanted to give Ahaz was the birth of Christ. God with us. The virgin will be with child and give birth to a son. He, that is the, re the Redeemer, the Messiah, he will eat curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. Speaking of his age, by the time he reaches the age of accountability, before the boy knows how to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. So allowing 15, 16 years, let's say, um, the two kings will be history. In fact, it turned out to be 15 years. The two kings, both that of um, the kingdom of the north and uh, the, you know, the ten tribes of, um, of um, Israel led by Pekah, who was son of Remalia, who was the king of Israel, and Rezin, who was the king of Aram, um, in 15 years they were gone, totally destroyed. And uh, so the promise here to Ahaz is that the Lord um, will bring on you and your people and on the house of your father a time Unlike any, since Ephraim broke away from Judah, he will bring the king of Assyria, and uh, God was going to bring an end to Assyria. And so he's going to uh, punish uh, Israel, he's going to punish Aram for their insolence and for their rebellion, and um, everyone would enjoy the curds and, and um, honey. Well, the king refused to let um, the sign be provided because of his lack of faith. So then the Lord said to um, Isaiah in chapter 8, he said, Take a large scroll and write on it with an ordinary pen this name. This name is Maher Shalal Hashbaz, which means quick to the plunder, swift to the spoil. And I will call in Uriah the priest and Zechariah as reliable witnesses for me. So Isaiah goes to his wife. She conceives and gives birth to a son, and they name him Mahar Shalal Hashbaz. And the Lord says, Isaiah, we're going to use your son instead of the virgin giving birth and conceiving, 
we're going to use your son to make a point. Before the boy knows how to say my father or my mother, before he has speech, in other words, the wealth of Damascus and the plunder of Samaria will be carried off by the king of Assyria. The Lord decreed it. And in 15 years, it, it happened. It, 722. The Lord spoke to Isaiah again, and he said, Listen, because this people has rejected the gently flowing waters of Shiloh. Now, you might remember that the, the pool at Shalom is where Jesus um, healed a man. Uh, there was once a man that was blind, and Jesus uh, put mud on his eyes and sent him to the pool to wash, remember? And uh, the Lord, uh, you know, the tabernacle was kept at Shiloh for uh, quite some time before being moved into Jerusalem. And as the river gently flowed through Shiloh, God is going to use some language here that is very pertinent to Revelation. And, in, and if you don't understand how he uses the language and uh, here, obviously, you're at a loss to make sense of Revelation, but notice how this flows, pun intended. Because this people has rejected the gently flowing waters of Shiloh and rejoices over Rezin, the son of Remalia. In other words, uh, they are, have formed an alliance to protect themselves. Therefore, the Lord is about to bring against them the mighty floodwaters of the great river Euphrates. The Lord is about to bring against them the mighty floodwaters of the river, the king of Assyria with all his pomp. In Old Testament times, the, the language of a flood sweeping over and going uh, through the town, wiping it out, ruining and destroying everything, this is why in the sixth trumpet we have the four angels that are loosed at the great river Euphrates and in the sixth bowl we have the great river Euphrates dried up. The significance of the river Euphrates is important. In ancient times the river Euphrates was to be the northernmost boundary for Israel. The river Euphrates was to serve as a natural boundary preventing the tribes, uh, the kingdoms of the north from coming into Israel. You know, a river is a, is a double-edged sword. If you have an army and you wish to attack an adversary and you have to cross the river to do so, that could be rather frightening because the river could, if you do not succeed in defeating your adversary, the river then becomes the place where you die as you retreat because everyone knows that the winning army chases the other to the river and there annihilates them and washes them away. So God designed that the river Euphrates would be the northernmost boundary for the nation of Israel and the uh, Red Sea would be the southernmost boundary. These um, natural boundaries, and of course the great desert, you know, to the east, and the Mediterranean to the west, put Israel in a very powerful, geographically protected location. But unfaithfulness. It is it does not mean that natural boundaries are everlasting. So God is saying he's going to bring the king of Assyria across the river. And, and the king of Assyria is going to be like a mighty flood water that just sweeps on over its banks and sweeps into Judah, swirling over it, passing through it, and reaching up to the neck. Its outspread wings will cover the breadth of your land, O Emmanuel. This language in Isaiah 8 is like the language in Revelation 
9 and chapter 16. In Revelation 9, the four angels loosed at the river Euphrates, and they go forward in the sixth trumpet, and they kill a third of mankind. This is talking about utter, total, global destruction of human beings. God is going to allow the Antichrist, who is the devil, physically masquerading as God, to send forth his armies throughout the world to take control of the world, just as God is sending Assyria, the king of Assyria, into Judah to wipe it out, to, I mean, into Israel to wipe it out. The, the parallel is identical if you understand the use of language. And God is describing the oncoming king of Assyria like the mighty floodwaters of the river Euphrates. Listen to this language. Raise the war cry, you nations, and be shattered. Listen, all you distant lands. Prepare for battle and be shattered. Prepare for battle. You're not going to win. You will be shattered. Devise your strategy, but it will be thwarted. Propose your plan, but it will not stand, for God is with us. The Lord spoke to me, Isaiah said, with his strong hand on me, warning me not to follow the way of this people. He said, Do not call conspiracy everything that these people call conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear and do not dread it. The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. You know, I've conducted many seminars around the country and invariably, someone comes up to me and says, Larry, what do you think about this theory or this conspiracy or the Illuminati or the Trilateral Commission or the Bilderbergers or whatever, Federal Reserve. I mean, it goes on and on and on. And, and you know, I turn to Isaiah chapter 8 here, and God said, listen to Isaiah. In, the, in, in those days, there was much war and political unrest and there were rumors of this conspiracy and of that conspiracy, this and that and what have you, and no one could ferret out or know the truth anyway. And all that the talk of this conspiracy stuff only fostered was fear. It's no different today. It's no different today in a number of circles. There is a, a, a very strong confidence in many people that conspiracies are ruling the earth and ruling the world. And the Lord comes to Isaiah and he puts his hand, his strong hand upon him, and he said, look, Isaiah, do not fear what this people fears and do not dread what they dread. The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear and he is the one you are to dread. In God's hands, all things are and have their being. This next verse is really neat. Verse 14. And he will be a sanctuary, but for both houses of Israel, he will be a stone that causes men to stumble, a rock that makes them fall. And for the people of Jerusalem, he will be a trap and a snare, Many of them will stumble. They will fall and be broken. They will be snared and captured. God is trying to communicate over the period of the life of Isaiah, time and time and time again, destruction and redemption, punishment and restoration. And he's trying to explain why the punishment. And he's trying to hold out hope that his purposes will ultimately be accomplished. What this really teaches is that nations pass a point, as well as individuals, 
where repentance has no redeeming um, effect. It is possible to go past the point of no return. And once that is accomplished, the only thing that remains is the certain dreadful and fearful anticipation of the judgments of God. Israel has passed its point of return. It is too far gone. God can't do anything with it, and he's about to destroy it. And he's letting King Ahaz know the same is true of Judah unless they straighten up. They do have a chance. But alas, they will not respond. So God says to Isaiah, Bind up the testimony. The testimony is the Ten Commandments. And seal up the law. The law is the book of Moses. Among my disciples. I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. I will put my trust in him. The idea here is that even though destruction is coming, God is going to preserve a few with a knowledge and an understanding of what his ways and what his purposes and what his plans are so that at the time appointed for restoration there will be those like Nehemiah and Ezra and others who will understand what God is attempting to do. You've got to understand the Babylonian captivity is going to be for 70 years in length and very few will be able to see both, both ends of the captivity. Those who go into captivity will be too old to make the trip back to the promised land at the time of restoration. So God is saying, even though you're going to the land of a, of a foreigner, even though you're going into captivity, I want to do my best to see that you are, that a, that a knowledge of what happened and why it happened and what my purposes and what my intentions are is, this knowledge is preserved. Here am I and the children of the Lord has given to me. We are signs and symbols in Israel, for the Lord Almighty dwells on Mount Zion. So God is saying, look, there's going to be a time when I'm going to bring about restoration and my people who hear my voice will respond. When men tell you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? The dead know nothing. Solomon wrote that years ago. Ah, verse 20. To the law of Moses and to the testimony, the Ten Commandments, if they do not speak according to this word, they have no light in them. The problem in Isaiah's day is no different than in our day. A lot of people are preaching, quotes, the word of the Lord, but it does not measure up to the gold standard of truth, God's law. And his law was given both in the testimony, the Ark of the Covenant, you know, the, the Ten Commandments are called the testimony, and the law was a reference to the books of Moses. So, if they don't line up Isaiah with what Moses has written and what I plainly state, stated in the Ten Commandments, these preachers are false. Distressed and hungry, they will roam through the land when they are famished, they will become enraged and looking upward will curse their king and their God. Remember, God's anger is directed at the leaders, both political and religious. After he has made such strident remarks about the condition of his people, here comes some hope. Nevertheless, chapter 9, verse 1, 
There will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. These are the you know two of the tribes in the north. God humbled their land by simply destroying them. But in the future, he will honor that same territory, Galilee of the Gentiles, by the way of the sea along the Jordan. Isn't that interesting? The land that had been purged of his people will be a land honored. How, does it, how will this honor come? Look at verse 2. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And here, for the next few verses, we talk about the coming and the promise of a Messiah, a Savior, one who will restore and accomplish and lead the people to, con to accomplish all that was originally intended. For unto us, verse 6, a child is born, a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government, peace, of government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Now, Ahaz has rejected the sign of the Lord. Around, approximately around 720 B.C., Ahaz has rejected the sign. He would not ask the Lord for the sign. And the Lord said, very well. Then Isaiah, you go have a child by your wife and name him Meher Mahlal Hashbaz so that uh, his name, he will be symbolic of what I am about to do to this people. Instead of a savior, instead of a messianic figure, I'm going to give you a figure that symbolizes destruction. Here in chapter 9, the Lord is saying through Isaiah to the people, even though you're going to go into captivity, even though you're going to be punished, at the appointed time, God is going to honor Galilee, the land of the Gentiles now formerly inhabited by the tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali, you know, two of the ten tribes. But God now is giving it to the Gentiles, and he's going to honor it, because out of that land, out of Galilee, will come a great light. For unto us a child is born, and to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. I'll tell you what. To find a government official that is righteous, that is keen on justice and fairness, and has the wisdom to deal rightly and fairly. That's what verse 7 says, and it's so neat. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. And the zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. Oh my, hope and promise of destruction. This seesaw back and forth in the book of Isaiah is so telling. It, it, it says that God's love and God's plan and God's interest in man is so, is so intense. And yet because of ignorance, because of rebellion, because of stupidity and darkness, people wander away, and God says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. It, it, it's absolutely identical with today. We, are, we fall so far short. We have fallen so far away from the will of God. 
And people say, what is the will of God? And when you begin to study his word and you begin to see what his will is, it really isn't complicated or hard to understand, but so few people are willing to study. That's what I hope this tape and all of these tapes will do, is that it'll provide an a, a introductory way to engage you in studying and, and spending time in your Bible looking at the wonderful truths and the wonderful promises and the wonderful ways of God are revealed there. In verse 14 of Isaiah 9, Isaiah says, So the Lord will cut off from Israel both head and tail. I like this one. Both palm branch and reed in a single day. The elders and prominent men are the head, the head of the nation. Listen to this next sentence. The prophets who teach lies are the tail. <laughs> those who guide this people mislead them, and those who are guided are led astray. So there you have it. Now you know the head and the tail. The head are the politicians, and the tail are the preachers. Therefore the Lord will take no pleasure in the young men, nor will he pity the fatherless and widows, for everyone is ungodly and wicked, and every mouth speaks vileness. Yet for all of this, his anger is not turned away, his hand is still upraised. Surely wickedness burns like a fire, it consumes briars and thorns. It sets the forest thickets ablaze, so that it rolls upward in a large column of smoke. By the wrath of the Lord Almighty, the land will be scorched, and the people will be fuel for the fire. No one will spare his brother. Um, for those of you who understand Revelation 8, verse 7, you should get a, catch a clue here. When the first trumpet sounds and the fiery meteoric showers fall upon the earth, everyone will rightly conclude that the wrath of God has broken out upon the land. By the wrath of the Lord Almighty, the land will be scorched and the people will be fuel for the fire. No one will spare his brother. On the right they will devour, but still be hungry. On the left they will eat, but will not be satisfied. Each will feed on the flesh of his own offspring, Manasseh will feed on Ephraim and Ephraim on Manasseh, and together they will turn against Judah. Yet for all of this, God's anger is not turned away. His hand is still upraised. Woe to those, he says in chapter 10, who make unjust laws, and to those who issue oppressive decrees. Woe to deprive the poor of their rights and withhold justice from the oppressed of my people making widows their prey and robbing the fatherless? What will you do on the day of reckoning when disaster comes from afar? To whom will you run for help? Where will you leave your riches? Nothing will remain but to cringe among the captives or fall among the slain. Yet for all this God's anger is not turned away. His hand is still upraised. In the rest, as chapter 10 goes on, we've got to come to a close to today. Our time has run out. God is going to now fit, but redirect an explanation of, of an important point. He's going to use the Assyrian as an instrument of his wrath against Israel and Judah. Okay? Then... He's going to deal with Assyria by, by sending the Babylonians against the Assyrians. Then later we're going to learn that God is going to deal with the Babylonians by sending the Medes and the Persians against them when their cups of iniquity have reached full. This is a concept that is most important to understand that 
God's patience with nations has a limit. And when that limit is reached, nothing, nothing, I repeat, nothing, can prevent the implementation and the execution of the wrath of God. It comes in whatever form he chooses, whether it be fire from the sky or whether it be another nation. God is capable and he does take care of business. Well, we're out of time for today. It's been a joy to be with you. I look forward to our next uh, study. Uh, David should be back, and uh, we'll have a chance to share as we pick up in uh, Isaiah chapter 10. May God bless you and keep you and prosper you as you study his word and seek wisdom from the Creator. May God bless you. May God bless you. May God bless you. May God bless you.